recording. Okay. As I have mentioned earlier, um, so that the recording will capture it. Okay. Um, Jen, one of the things that you are you were facing in the past assignment was that you are not getting the tables, right? One of the big reason for that is that you're running a big code. This table has like 7,000 rows and we're running nested loops on those 7,000 rows. So it will take time. Uh, it will take time. So when it's when you reset your kernel, right? Uh, reset your kernel, this cell here will be empty. That means that code was not ran. And then when you run that cell using this button or or this button, it will turn into an asterisk. While it's still in the in asterisk, that means it's still running. The time that it becomes a number, then that means that it completed its run. It's, so that's the only time that you will see either an error or if you did it correctly, the right table, right? So, so keep that in mind. Check if um, that works for you. Um, you start the kernel um, and then run everything again. If it does not work for you, let's set up um, a session. Um, after this, uh, after this session, we will, I will just prepare the teach one people, and then after that, I'll open it up for other participants to consult. Okay, um, I'll set it up later. I think one of you, Ria, I think wants to um, have a session as well. Okay, so let's begin. So data preparation is a huge step um, in our in data analysis, not just for um, EHRs, um, not just for health data, but for any data analysis. It's just that health data is a bit more complex than other data sets, right? Um, financial data sets just have numbers. But healthcare data have has numbers, words, diagnoses, and stuff like that. Um, okay, so now we're at part three. So we've been doing data preparation for three weeks. For th this is the third week of data preparation, um, and we will still do one more week next week. So four weeks of data preparation before we actually do. Um, some analysis, particularly we're doing likelihood ratios, okay? So that's the same thing when you're doing this analysis in real life uh, or in industry or in research, if you're going the academic path. Uh, data analysis will take up like, sorry, data preparation, data cleanup will take up like 80 to 90% of your time, okay? Running um, the analysis, which, which is like modeling, will take up a few lines of code, right? A few lines of code. So it's data preparation um, that's taking up time. Modeling doesn't take up a lot of time, uh, but you have to prepare your data so that your models um, produce uh, reliable results. And then once Reporting on the results takes another chunk of time. Okay. So just to recap, we did a few things last week. We flattened the data, converted it um, as uh, the teacher one mentioned from a wide format to a long format. Okay. Uh, so in SQL, we also call it, and we call that um, normalization. We normalize the tables. Okay. And then we created data points to tag remission um, using anti on, for the antidepressant data. We created our main analysis data frame um, because we are now final. We now finally have the antidepressant data, and we can calculate um, age values. So it's like the perfect time to to create this main analysis data frame. Um, and then we changed, we created our first dummy variables, which are age that we converted to bins. Okay. Um, so again, um, 
for what we call in in uh, data science as one hot encoding. And finally, our final step last week for our data preparation was um, indicators for antidepressant history. So our data set is becoming wider. So it is we we let we we flattened our data set, but it's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger again. Okay, so this is this will be our like fine expected final output once you ran your code for the assignment. Okay, so it will look something like this. And then I just did some um, testing there. So now what are we going to do? Still, we'll continue with the data preparation. We'll break out into lab sessions where the teach you will um, do the teach one, um, what the teach one vi videos teach you. <laughs> Um, and then we will rate the teach ones, okay? Rate the teach ones. I will um, have a few minutes with uh, with our two new best friends for next week, Digna and Eric. So you will be helping me uh, with the teach one next week. So you'll stay over for a while. I'll prepare you, give you some pointers. Um, and then finally, just for this session, because um, I think there's some, some people having a tough time with the homework, I will um, stay and uh, meet with you, meet as much of you as possible before uh, before you give up or I give up. <laughs> okay, um, to set to uh, to fix your issues. Okay. Um, Okay, but um, I would like to request that during this the consulting session, um, we'll make it a group to make it more uh, more productive, um, so that I can every time I teach something like if that's the same problem that someone else is facing, that that also um, helps that other person. Okay. So now we're going to do a lot more things, right? But the but the code will be shorter because we have made the necessary preparations, we already have the necessary um, data structure, and that by flattening the data, so that allows us to make uh, our codes more streamlined, um, our joins our aggregations more streamlined. So um, every time that we meet, I go back to the, the reference research and look at what data points we need to generate in order for us to replicate their findings. So we needed an indicator for female at birth, OK? Um, so they just assume that if you're not female at birth, then you might be male. Right, or you chose not to disclose. Okay. Um, and then we need to count the numbers of depression episodes, remissions, and antidepressants taken prior to each trial. Um, we need to then, at this point in time, we're, we're more or less complete with our antidepressants data. We'll now prepare the, the other humongous data set, which is the disease data set. So we will do some preliminary stuff like removing duplicates and then grouping diseases into body systems. Okay. And finally, um, for our data cleanup task, we will combine disease data sets, um, the disease data set with the main data, data set. Okay. And retain only the diseases that occur prior to the antidepressant trial because diseases that occur after the antidepressant will not be uh, 
like predictive will not predict your antidepressant outcome, right? But diseases that occur before like co comorbidities, right? Comorbidities that you have before taking the antidepressant might affect uh, your outcomes. And finally, um, I think last week I had a discussion with one of the groups that it's taking it's now taking a lot of time to run everything um, um, again from the start from the beginning just to run your the last line of code that you have right um, so we'll create a data checkpoint um, this is a check uh, a technique that um, I'm, I do um, when I'm working with large data sets like I I don't know if you do video games but you you save your game <laughs> here i save my data so that i can access this i can access it um, um, in a future time and not do all the previous um processes that i've done right uh and and this portion of the data is a good way a good point to create the checkpoint because at this point we only will be left with one data set Right, we started with four data sets. Right, after this, we will only have one data set the analysis data set, the big analysis data set. Okay, we won't do the lab breakout yet. Okay, so let's begin. So, um, as you can probably tell by now i start off with a very simple code just to warm things up um, the first thing that we will do is create an indicator for female sex at birth okay um, this is an indicator used in the study okay um, so usually we try to convert data into a into binary data and that will allow our analysis to run more effectively this is just on and off right so we converted last time age into age groups and age groups into dummy variables and those dummy variables are binary data just like um, what you see here right ones and zeros right ones and zeros same thing with our antidepressant uh, history right ones and zeros so even for other categorical variables, um, we wanted to convert them to, to binary data. But there's a special handling if you're working with dichotomous data, me meaning a, a, a data set with just two, with just two um, variables, right? So that, that includes gender, male and female. Right? Uh, uh, presence, which is present or absent, right? Um, so if that's it's only uh, two variables, uh, two possible values for that variable, you can convert it into just a single row, just single column rather, compared to um, what we did for for the dummy variables, where there's one column for each age group. Here we will convert it into just one column right representing one possible value of that of that variable and then if it's zero then it's the other variable okay so here female then we will have this um, lady as a female this one as a female at birth okay and this this person is not female at birth okay and then to do that, it's easy enough. We'll use numphy where gender is equal to female. Then we do one, otherwise we do zero. Okay. So that's that's where uh, that's the easy part. Now we want to fill out the details on episodes and remission history. We want to find out how many depression episodes the person had prior to taking your antidepressant. We also wanted to find out how many re remissions the person had prior to taking that antidepressant. 
Okay, so we will split this into two tasks, one for episodes and one for remission, but the codes are relatively similar. Okay. So for um, counting number of episodes, number of episodes, we just create a new function, get episodes count. Okay. Um, it will just pass the row. Uh, okay. So how do we know the previous episode? So we, we get the same person ID, should be the same person ID. But you have, but that particular row medication ended, that particular medication ended before this medication started. Okay. We will use medication as a proxy or what we call a substitute for depression episodes. Okay. Because um, we did not um, have data on actual diagnosis um, episodes, right? So, we, but we have data on, on, on medication. So we will use medication as a proxy for, um, for depression episodes. Okay. So again, the medication should have ended before the current medication started. So that will be a previous episode, right? It's not a future episode. It's not a, a, a concurrent episode like a present episode. If this data set is empty, then there's no there's no episodes. The count is zero. Okay. The next thing we'll do is arrange the values by start date. Why? Because we wanted to make sure that we account for overlapping medications. So for example, for a current um, antidepressant episode, uh, for a current depression episodes, I'm taking three antidepressants, right? I want to account for those three antidepressants ta being taken at the same time, okay? So I want to arrange the, the, the data by start date, arrange the data by start date, and then track the start date and the end date at each row and see whether they're overlapping or not. If they're overlapping, then I'll count that as one episode. If they're not overlapping, then another episode has occurred, right? A new episode of depression has occurred. Okay. So we initialize the variables initially because you already uh, returned zero if, if previous episode is empty. That means these codes below this below will not be ran if the episodes are empty. So if it did, these codes ran, meaning there's at least one row, there's at least one row um, in the previous episode. So I just put in by default there's one episode. Okay. And then by default I don't know the start date and then and the current end date. So so sorry, this should be end date. Okay. So there's about there's there should be current end date. Okay. Now, um, now I look through the previous episodes. Okay. If the current start date is none, right? The current start date is none. That means I'm in the first row because um, I had I haven't assigned any value to the start date yet. Right. Oh. So if the current start date is none, then I'll take the start date and end date, end dates to, together. Uh, and move on, right? Because in, if the start date is not none, meaning I'm tracking an episode, right? There's an episode that I'm tracking. I'll look at, um, the start date and the current end date. If the start date is less than the current end date, that means um, that means that that group, that row is overlapping or within the current episode. So I just uh, I just adjust the end date to the maximum of the current end date and that that particular row's end date. 
So if the current end date, for example, is um, February 29, the current end date in this variable is February 29. And then that particular medication ends at February 15, then I'll use February 29, right? Because this will be subsumed by, by the current date that I'm tracking. If it's a reverse, then I'll use the previous end date because now um, from February 15, the current, the current episode is until February 15. Now I'll extend that the current episode is until February 29. Okay. However, if the current end date is greater than, I'm um, sorry, if the current start date is greater than the end date that I'm tracking, that means there's another episode. So I just increase the episode count and then track the start and end dates again. And we have learned this in the previous um, codes that we can use apply to call the function for each row of the data frame. So, and we assign it to number of episodes. Okay. By doing so, we should have a number of episodes field here. And I use this code to check if I have the right um, logic. Um, so I just pick at random a, a person number from here. And then and then copy that to a test data frame, sorted the values of the test data frame, increase in increasing start date. So it's easier for me to assess and, and then display it. Okay, so here, for example, there's this is zero. Why? Because it's the first row. So our, our logic holds. This is one, right? Um, because the previous episode ended April and then the current episode started again May. Okay. So it's one. This is still one. Why? Because this episode is an overlap of the previous episode. See, it started. September 2005, this one started um, May 2005, so they they overlapped because this should have ended, this episode ended um, 2007, okay? So it overlapped. So, and then finally, this will be two because this one, Cetralin started at 2008, which is already after the 2007 um, Cytolo-Pram episode, okay? So, yeah. Seems right. Seems right. Okay. Now we will um, count the number of permissions. A bit easier. A bit easier. As you see, the code is shorter than this one, right? Because similarly, we'll just get the previous episodes. If the episodes are empty, then we'll return zero because there's no remission. You have you didn't have any remission. Okay. But if it's not zero, right? Um, uh, again, this I, I think this this code should be optional. It won't do anything. Um, so I'll just delete this so that each one will have the right code. Okay. Um, and then we'll just sum up if remission. Because remember, this is the good thing about binar binarized um, columns. If you sum the binarized columns, you'll get the count. <laughs> so if you sum remission, you'll get all the count of all the people who have of all the remission because it's one every time there's a remission, right? So one plus zero plus zero plus zero plus zero plus one plus one. And stuff like that will just give you the count, right? So that's another shortcut that you can do because you have binarized the variables. Okay. And then we just return the remission count and call get permission count um, using apply, the apply um, method uh, for the data frames, and store it in a column called number of permissions. You'll get something like this. There should be number of permissions here. I use head 20 at this point in time because there's, I want to see um, a lot of history 
um, a lot of history together. And then again, checking, checking the count, number of remissions. Here it's zero because it's the first row. There's no remission history yet. Here it's one because there's an SR here. See, there's one. Um, and then let's see, yeah, there's one remission here. Okay. And so on. Sorry, sorry, not that's the the wrong the wrong row. So here it's one because I look at the previous the previous columns, the previous episodes. There's only there's one. Okay. So I think here it's two because the previous remissions here and here add up to two. Okay. Here it's one because it's still the same episode as as this guy. All right, I think it works. So, all right. And finally, on the triplets of the, uh, so as you see, this function just morphs differently for each um, antidepressants. We can, e we can probably improve this by doing like a type, right? Um, count type here. And then similar to how we did our um, our antidepressant history where we put history type, we can probably do count type and just encapsulate it in, in one function. But this is another way of doing it. It's cleaner, I think, um, so that, uh, and then, as well, easier to put in at each one because the quotes are shorter. Um, so now we count the, the number of previous antidepressants okay, taken per trial. Uh, again, we get the previous episodes. Um, sorting it is optional, it does not do anything. Um, if the previous episode is empty, then there's no previous antidepressants. Okay. Um, but if um, if it's not empty, then we count unique antidepressants, unique and AD grouping. So n unique means number of unique, and then we will get we will store that in num antidepressants again by calling the apply uh, function. Calling the function using the apply method, and then we have a number of ah, antidepressants here. You can again check using the same code. So here we have one antidepressant. There's only one row before before this. Um, here we have again one um, because this does, did not end before this one. Okay. So it only counted that one at the top and so on. Okay. And that's it. We're done with, for now, with antidepressants. I think when I look back on the research, there's probably not a lot of other data points that we can, you can get from this data set. Okay. I'll look again, but I think now we're done. So it's a good time to prepare our other data frame. Our other data frame is the diseases data frame. Okay. I just wanted to um, get a grasp of how many rows it has. So it has 4,700,000 rows, 4.7 million rows. I try to try to reduce the number of rows by removing duplicates okay if it's the same person for the same disease with the same start time and end time yeah it's, it's a duplicate right um so why why would that happen because in in health records in health records there might be um, several diagnoses for a patient. 
one diagnosis came from the emergency room, another diagnosis came from when you were an inpatient, another diagnosis came when you were um, in UHAR in your follow-up checkup. But all of them um, happened, for example, within the same day or within the same week. But it's entered several times into the, EH, the EHR. So we want to remove those cases. We only, we only want um, one row for each representation of this kind of data. Same person ID, same standard concept code, and same time, same same dates and times. Okay. So we have reduced it by almost a million rows from 4.7 million to 3.8 million. Okay. Now, it's another familiar thing that we do, that we did, okay, that we will do. So we will group the disease. Uh, the disease groups we will group the diseases based on disease groups okay uh, so similar to our um, previous uh, task when we group antidepressants together we will have to download a file open online courses details Mm -hmm. That's not work. Wait, let me use a non-Chrome browser. Okay. Um, so where do we go? We go to the, the, our All of Us project page. Scroll down. And then there's uh, a CSD file organizing conditions. We download that. Okay. Should have DF disease group that CSV. Okay. Save it wherever. I won't. Um, and then once you have that, again, go to file here, open, put it in a folder where you store your date, your previous CSV file where you read, okay? I stored it in a folder called data, but some of you stored it just in this main folder. Okay. Some of you I saw stored it in a data underscore two folder. So it will be up to you where you store it. So depending on where you store it, you either just call this, right? If it's in the same, it's just in the same base folder or sorry, something like this, um, something like this. If you store it, stored it in a folder called data, if you stored it in a folder called data too, call it this way. I stored it in a folder called data. Okay. So you just have to read it. So here, this file has the standard concept code, this one, Standard concept code is a standard way of uh, addressing a particular condition. Here it's um, using SNOMED or the systematic nomenclature of something of medical clinical terms. Um, so it's using SNOMED codes. So this SNOMED code will correspond, for example, to a disease. So Primarily malignant neoplasm of maximalary sinus is no med code 9388900. Okay. Now, SNOMED is also arranged in hierarchies. So there are parents. Okay. So I'm interested in diseases that can be grouped into body systems. Okay. So for example, here, let's just look at here. So what's the SNOMED code? What's no 36296004 mean? It's the disorder of the endocrine system. Okay. How about SNOMED code 9280000? It's the disorder of the of musculoskeletal system. So this file effectively 
um, has like all the 20,000 different diseases possible inside of all of us and then groups it into the particular body system that it's a part of. If it's not part of a body system, it will be grouped to group zero. Okay, so that's so that's how it does. Yeah, 25,000 different diseases. So uh, this is changing the data type, data type because I found that standard concept code in the diseases data frame was not an integer, but uh, it was an integer in the in the mapping data frame that we got. Okay, so we just again for grouping easiest ways to do a left join. So we left joined, and now we have a disease group. Um, column here. And we will now create our, our single analysis data frame by combining the analysis data frame and the diseases data frame left join. Right? We need to retain all the all the all the relevant trial data. Um, and and then and then for each trial, have all the diseases that um, that person had. Okay, so this will dramatically increase the number of rows that we have. So remember that the diseases data frame had 3.8 million rows, right? 3.8 million rows, and I think our analysis data frame at this point has like 7,000 rows. Okay, 7,000 rows. So I'm expecting the number of um, the number of rows to be ginormous again. So it is, it became 18 million rows, okay? After we did the left join, analysis data frame, diseases data frame, with analysis data frame on the left, diseases data frame on the right, um, okay? We joined them on person ID. We now have a data, we now exploded our analysis data frame from 7,000 rows to 18 million rows. Okay. Now, moving forward, how can we reduce this number of rows? Because the more, the bigger your data set, the slower it gets or the more expensive your computing will get, okay? So we need to always think about how to reduce uh, the number of data that we're processing, but without sacrificing the quality of our analysis, okay? So one thing that we can do to reduce the number of rows is to retain only rows where the condition started before the antidepressant started. Why? Because again, similar to how we, uh, did it before, um, we have to make sure that the disease is present and that will be an indicator or that might influence the outcome of the antidepressant. So if the disease is present, meaning it started, it's present, it's present before you started your antidepressant, then that comorbidity might affect might affect the outcome of the antidepressant. Okay, but if it happened after you took on you took your antidepressant, then there's no causal relationship, right? The cause cannot come after the effect. Right? So, so we will remove um, we will remove all diseases that happened after the antidepressant was started. Okay, and that greatly reduced our number of rows from 18 million. To six million, right? So yeah, but we removed twelve million rows, and that allowed us to make this more manageable. Okay, so now our data frame looks like this. Okay, uh, and then I saw I I just saw that the in the head, all the trial numbers are one. I just wanted to make sure that there are trial numbers greater than one, and there are so. Uh, okay. 
So that's where our data cleanup will end for now. Okay. Now we will have to think strategically about starting over. Right? If you see here, <clears throat> I have 72 cells. So by next week, I don't want to run all 72 cells again so that I can run my 73rd cell. Okay. So we will create a data checkpoint. Okay. A data checkpoint is just a simple way of us saving our data into a CSV file so that next week I will not run all the 70, 72 rows of 72 cells of code. I will start here on the 73rd cell and just read, I'm sorry, on the 76, 76th cell. And I will just read that CSV file that we created. Okay. Um, but um, there's a risk that um, reading from a file might change our um, our data types. Particularly, I think the dates when you read it from from a CSV file, it becomes text. So we want to make sure that we know all the data types before writing into a file. So that's why I, I created this dot info. So I have a list of all the columns before I wrote it into a checkpoint file and then all the relevant data types. And then easily, um, it, as just as easily as reading from uh, a file, you can write to a file. This will also take time. This analysis data frame has is two gigabytes, so it's really big. It's a big CSV file, so it will take time again to execute. What I did as a personal preference is created. I created a checkpoint folder. I stored it there, right? But you can easily just store it wherever, right? Uh, so if you don't have a folder, your code will look like this. If you have a folder, then you, you will your code will look like folder. analysis right so my folder is checkpoint and I wrote the analysis data frame there so it's in the checkpoint folder analysis data frame it's two gigabytes right you can even download it but I think um, it yeah might as well not because it will not run in your computer so now succeeding runs succeeding runs I will just restore my analysis data frame from that file, right? I put low memory equals to false um, because again, it's a big file um, and there's a lot of type mismatch. Um, so I'll to make sure that it reads correctly. But if you do it this way, right, without the low memory equals false, um, it will still run, but there's a warning. I don't, I don't like, um, I don't like messy, messy warning uh, messages if I can avoid them. And now we can see that indeed, that indeed some of the data types have been changed, particularly the dates. Okay. So here I commented all the data types. For example, integer columns should be this ones. And I checked, yeah, the integer columns are still integers. All the float, these are the float columns. I checked and all the, all these columns are still float columns. And these are the date columns, okay? And they are all incorrect. So I looked through these date columns and change their data type to a date time data type, okay? And errors equals coerce is because there are some inconsistency with um, the dates, the dates um, data type uh, in in the CSV file. So here it just forces the conversion even if there's inconsistency, okay, or coerces the conversion. And finally, um, I didn't, I don't like standard concept name or standard concept code. Uh, it's 
I just changed the name to disease name and disease code so that it's easier to for me to understand in my later analysis. Okay, and let's check, and that's uh, where we are at now. So we have successfully just re read our analysis data frame from CSV file. And this is where your um, assignment will, the, the teach one will end next week, okay. Um, so now, as you can see, that resolves our problem with um, with running several lines of code every time, right? So we can start at line 70, um, where's that? Line 76, right? Next time, right? We don't have to run like line 74. But um, that does not still solve our issue of performance, right? Our data frame is becoming really huge. It has a six million rows. Your you were having trouble executing um, functions for a data frame with seven thousand rows. Now we have six point six million rows, so that will eat up a lot of resources. So. And, and this is the lesson that I told you that big data sets require bigger costs. So I will pause this, um, this um, server so that you can see. In order to manage that, okay, in the following um, following sessions that we will have, we will, I would recommend that we use a bigger server, okay? So before we were using the laptop size server, the CPU was four and the RAM was 15 gigs, okay? So I guess the RAM was 16, 15 gigs. Now I would recommend that we upgrade it by just doubling it, doubling the number of CPUs and the number of RAM. That will increase our cost. So before it was like 25 cents per hour. Now it will be 39 cents per hour. But um, I think we will save that in terms of the time we wait for our code to execute, okay? You can try to make it a bigger, um, server but again your cost will increase um and yeah you own you you have a 300 dollars it will go a long way um and then another thing that you can try to ch to um change is automatically for pause after idle from three minute 30 minutes change it to like something like four hours so that it will not stop uh, before four hours are up. Okay. So let me just rerun this again. Okay. That's so here again, change, change this to eight, change this to 30. And this one changed to something like four hours or eight hours yeah, here. Eight hours, I think this changes to eight hours. Here, before this was four, this was 15, and this was three. You can now change it to probably eight, and then this one is 30, this one is eight, okay? So that you don't lose work. And then once you did those changes, did those changes, you will click next, and then, um, apply and now you have a bigger server so when you start your project it will use the bigger server okay. so that's it we created all of these and and just like last week just like last week and all the 
our we will break out into groups um we will break out into groups and work on the assignment uh, for next week uh, the assignment will be the same as what each ones have done. Um, I will stop sharing now and I will stop recording.